Uh, good morning and welcome to the 32nd meeting of the committee in 2014. Uh, everyone present is asked to switch off mobile phones uh, and other electronic equipment as they affect the broadcasting system. Some committee members may consult tablets uh, during the meeting. That's because we provide papers in a digital format. Uh, we have re received apologies this morning from Alec Rowley. Before I move on to the agenda, I'd like to start by welcoming the new members of the committee, Claire Adamson and Willie Coffey. Uh, I hope you enjoy your time here. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to record our thanks to Mark MacDonald and Stuart McMillan for their work in the committee over the last few years. On behalf of the committee, I wish them well in their new committee roles. Agenda item one um, is declarations of interest for new members. Can I invite Claire and Willie to make any relevant declarations for the record, please? Claire, please. I'd, I'd like to draw people's attention to my register of interest and state that I was a former member of North Lanarkshire Council. Thank you. Willie, please. Thanks, Convener. Similarly here, I was a former member of East Ayrshire Council, but beyond that, nothing uh, in addition to declare. Uh, thank you very much. And now we're a committee with uh, only one person who's not an ex-councillor, and that's Mr Buchanan. Uh, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, Cameron. Uh, agenda item two uh, is to consider whether we take item five in private. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Uh, agenda item three uh, is our second oral evidence-taking session on the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill. Uh, we have two panels of witnesses this morning. One representing groups who are supportive of a licensing system for air weapons, and the second panel consists of Police Scotland. So I'd like to welcome our first panel this morning, uh, Dr Michael North of the Gun Control Network, Jennifer Dunn, Senior Public Affairs Officer with the League Against Cruel Sports, and Chief Superintendent Michael Flynn of the Scottish Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Can I welcome you all? Uh, good morning. Uh, would you like to make any opening statements at all? Um, I'm happy to. Ms Dunn, if you want to go first, okay. please. Um, thanks very much, Convener, and thanks very much to the committee for having me along today. Um, we support licensing because, um, as well as helping um, air gun attacks on um, people, the old um, licensing will reduce um, air gun attacks on animals. We believe that the vast majority of air gun attacks on animals are underreported, particularly to the police. Um, our figures show that from 2010 to 2012, the police, um, uh, the different police forces, as they then were, had 68 reported attacks on animals, while the SSP. SSPC recorded 178 in a single year alone. I did go back to Police Scotland and ask for an updated figure, but they said that they weren't able to provide that for more recent years. Um, we think the true figure is higher still. Um, an example why we believe that is domestic cats. Um, and domestic cats, because of their anatomy, um, when they're shot with an air gun, it often doesn't become apparent straight away. The cat will make its way home, and then in some cases it will um, develop signs of an illness, and it's only um, a period of time later when it's taken to the vets that it will become apparent that, um, that the illness is due to an air gun injury, and by that point the owner might or the vet might feel that there's little point in reporting it. Um, we believe that the, um, because there's so many air guns in circulation that the only way to... Um, all air guns attacks on animals is to have um, some form of licensing implemented. Thank you. Dr North, please. Um, I represent Gun Control Network and ever since GCN was founded in 1996 we have had concerns with air weapons. Uh, it's always been a major concern why it was ne it's necessary to differentiate between uh, uh, guns on the basis of um, their uh, mechanism and we believe that anything that's potentially lethal or uh, could um, uh, maim and injure uh, should be licensed so we have welcomed uh, the um, uh, Scottish government's moves to to license air weapons in Scotland um, over the 18 years that GCN has been in existence um, we've seen a number of, uh, of um, fatalities happen as a result of air gun in incidents and some of our members have had uh, have lost uh, children um, and had children uh, injured um, 
we feel that one of the problems has been a, a rather lax casual attitude towards air weapons and feel very strongly that registration sends out the right message and uh, reflects the um, degree of dangerousness of, of, of air weapons and that a licensing system would make uh, anyone who wanted to uh, use them think very seriously um, about um, their need to have, have one. Uh, leading to a subsequent reduction in the number of weapons and therefore the number of serious incidents. Thank you. Uh, Superintendent Flynn, please. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Um, <clears throat> obviously, the Scottish SBCA fully supports the proposal that's been put forward by the Scottish Government, and that's based solely on the work that we do, uh, the 170 uh, reports that were mentioned by Jennifer earlier. That is reports that are made to us. We, we've not got people going out trying to find animals. That's when vets or owners phone us and let us know what's happening. Uh, surprisingly, since this was first announced uh, back earlier this year, we've actually seen a rise in the amount of reported cases to us, mainly with cats and wildlife. Um, given that this legislation will allow anyone that's got a lawful purpose to have an air weapon to uh, have one, we don't see any reason why licensing is not a very sensible uh, solution. Thank you very much. Um, some of the submissions that we have had and some of the witnesses have suggested that the introduction of a licensing regime for air weapons will do nothing to reduce criminality uh, or increase public safety, uh, as those who choose to misuse such weapons won't bother getting a license. How would you respond to, to those suggestions? Dr North, first please. Um, as we said in our submission, I think uh, if you look at the reports of incidents in the media, and um, uh, we would suggest that they're, they, these underestimate the extent of the problem, um, these are not hardened criminals who are uh, responsible for these. Very often, uh, it is through the casual use by people who would otherwise not be undertaking criminal activity. Uh, uh, teenagers messing around with guns. Um, as someone who just happens to have an air gun who decides uh, to, to use it uh, on the spur of the moment to, th to threaten somebody. Um, and I think the idea that you divide uh, society into criminals and non-criminals is simplistic and doesn't help in this way. Uh, uh, our uh, reading of, of, of the various incidents is that a lot of them occur simply because people who are, do not take their uh, ownership of air weapons seriously um, uh, mis misbehave with them rather than uh, uh, go out to conduct criminal activity. Thank you. Ms Dunn, do you have a view on that? Um, yes, I would agree with that. I mean, the more, um, at the moment, it is very, very easy to buy an air weapon. Um, you know, virtually anyone can go into a shop and buy one um, if they're overage. And, OK, the, a licensing scheme won't solve the problem by itself. There would also need to be an amnesty and publicity, um, letting people know that licensing was going to be introduced. But at the moment, the situation with attacks on animals and also attacks on people is unacceptable, and um, really licensing is the only way to address that. Superintendent Flynn? Um, <clears throat> given the government's estimates of potentially up to 500,000 air weapons are out there, I firmly believe that a lot of these will be handed in if a licensing uh, scheme is uh, introduced. Therefore, you're taking a lot of the weapons out of circulation. We have no idea how many are actually used by the um, proper owner or just used by a relative or a youngster that's around the house. Um, given that a lot of the um, attacks that happen on specifically cats happen in built-up housing estates, um, that's where the fit and proper person would come in. Uh, we've always had a concern that you're always, you should always have uh, landowners' permission if you're going to do pest control and stuff like that. Nobody's got um, landowners' permission for shooting at like, the Union Canal in Edinburgh, the Lithgow Lock. Um, so if you go through the fit and proper persons test, if you're not a fit and proper person, you will be allowed to have one, but that should include a uh, provision that you must be able to demonstrate where you will be using the weapon and for what purpose. Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you very much. Good morning, panel. Good morning. Thank you. Um, how are the police going to handle this rash of licenses coming out? I mean, with what manpower? You know, you've got so many. If you've got to license them, you've got an awful lot of people to license. How would you handle that? Um, I'm not. 
question for this panel to answer. Yeah. That's maybe best safe for the, the next panel. If anybody does have a view, let, please indicate and we'll take you. I still be able to answer that question uh, fully for you, sir. Okay. I, I feel the same, and I think we'd, we'd always um, uh, suggested that the, uh, legislation like this should have a sort of phased-in process of, re uh, of registration, that new weapons should um, uh, uh, come under the registration system straight away, and that over a period of years, uh, current owners should um, uh, uh, be become licensed. Yeah, I mean, I would agree that the police are the best place to answer okay. that. Sorry, do you believe that then the people will be handing in the guns at an amnesty? Do you think that will work, that people, people who don't want to um, register them will, will be handing a lot of guns in? And I think there's a lot of responsible people out there that have got guns that probably have not used them for years, but they could fall into the hands of others. If you know that you have to comply with a law, a lot of, I believe a lot of guns will be handed in if they do not want to licence it because they've got a fit and proper purpose to do so. Thank you. Is the panel in agreement with that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of air guns out there that maybe get kept in a drawer and brought out very occasionally, and you know, it would be better generally if they were out of circulation. I think so long yeah. as there's a sufficient publicity, uh, so everybody is aware uh, that now is the time to, to hand them in, um, there will be a, a, a good response, and, and weapons that aren't wanted, Thank have you. been forgotten about, will be remembered and handed in. Thank you. Uh, John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, one of the arguments we've heard uh, against licensing is the argument that if we go to license air weapons, then some individuals may decide to trade up uh, and go for a firearms license or a shotgun license uh, rather than just relying on an air weapon. Uh, what would your view be on the issue if people did decide just to trade up, if they, and of course the, the application of the fit and responsible person, uh, may, they still may qualify uh, under the criteria that's set out. And in some cases, people have said it's, it may eventually be easier to apply for a, a shotgun license than it would be for a firearm license. Dr. North, please. I would hope that it didn't become easier to get a shotgun license. I hope the same standards would apply as they do now. Um, I'm, I'm not in any position to be able to, to know what's in the mind of or, uh, current air gun owners. I th suspect this is rather unlikely. I mean, perhaps there are a small number of, of people who currently uh, shoot with air guns but don't use shotguns or rifles who, 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 who would um, uh, change. But I, 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 I suspect um, those involved uh, uh, with, with shooting have probably overestimated uh, the uh, degree of interest in shooting that those who only shoot with air guns uh, or only have air guns uh, actually have. I, I'm not clear that that, that uh, problem, if it's seen as a problem, is actually there. I, mean, I think one of the attractions of your guns and why um, they um, are a problem at the moment is that, that you know they're fairly cheap to get hold of, fairly easy to get hold of, and that's why people have them. I mean, a shotgun is far more expensive. Um, their sort of storage and use is far more regulated, and I would think that, um, that it would be unlikely that many casual air gun users would um, trade up to a shotgun or seek to do so. Thank you, Superintendent Flynn. We totally welcome anybody that wished to trade up simply because they would be checked by the police. They would be made fully aware of the responsibilities of owning any weapon that can inflict pain, injury and potentially death. Um, Jennifer's just mentioned the security. At the moment, you can, I could go out and buy an air rifle and just keep it in my kitchen, keep it anywhere. Um, so if my house is broken into, that gun could go, it could be used. So the police are more than uh, capable. I have to declare an interest in the fact that I do own a firearms licence as part of my, my duties with the Scottish SPCA. And I know the process that you've got to go through and the police are very, very stringent. The other thing I would say is that I think the committee or the parliament would have to consider the actual cost of applying for a licence because that should not be borne by the police. If you want to own a, a weapon and you've got a purpose for doing so, you should be willing to pay the price of a licence and fee. Thank you. Mr Wilson. One of the, and that's the point in terms that, that I was trying to make in my earlier question is one of the issues that has arisen is the cost of applying for an air weapons licence. 
may be more expensive than applying for a firearms or a shotgun license because firearms and shotgun licenses are controlled by the UK government and have been set at the same price since 2001. Uh, if we go for full cost recovery of an air weapons license, then that may be substantially more than the current firearms or shotgun license. How would you seek to make sure that it didn't become too prohibitive in terms of the cost of our air weapons licence? Superintendent, first, please. <laughs> That's uh, something for politicians to argue with uh, <laughs> down south, really. Um, but I, I don't feel that the burden of cost should fall on the taxpayer or the, the police. Um, simply, no one has a right. We don't have a right to bear arms in this country. Um, if you want something that can potentially kill something, you should be willing to pay for it. And again, when people realise that they don't have a fit and lawful purpose or they do not have permission to shoot at certain places, that will encourage a lot of people just to get rid of their guns. Dr North? Um, we have had uh, a lot of discussion recently with, with the Home Office and Home Office Ministers about the, the, the issue of the... Uh, um, underfunding of the licensing process for, for firearms and shotguns licenses and understood at one time that there was going to be a significant increase. I think there will be some kind of increase, but we understand that the current government have, have <coughs> sort of blocked a, a, a full increase. Um, I'm rather dismayed that uh, uh, the police have, have to subsidise uh, the current application process, and it does raise the kind of problems that Mr Wilson has just uh, uh, alluded to, but I don't think that's a reason why we shouldn't bring in air gun licensing. Ms Dunn? I agree with everything that um, Mike and Dr North have said. My colleagues who um, lobby Westminster... Um, are raising the issue of the cost of shotgun licence and the subsidy with Westminster government. I should also add that the League Against Cruel Smart Sports submission to the Smith Commission asked for um, weapons licensing to be devolved to the Scottish Parliament. So um, the air gun licensing and um, higher calibre weapons could be considered holistically. Um, but I, again, I don't think that um, the position of the Westminster government should be a block to progress in Scotland. Thank you. Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Convener. Just one final question for Dr. North. Dr. North, you indicated in your opening remarks that there was a number of fatalities due to air weapons. Uh, and we know that in terms of the evidence we've heard before, there is quite clearly a number of serious injuries. But could you quantify the number of serious fatalities that have been uh, caused by air weapons? Um can't give you the numbers off the top of my head. I mean, it's probably averaging one, one per year in, 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 in Great Britain. Um, and this, um, over a, a period of 20 years, I said there's probably been about 15 young uh, people and teenagers uh, killed in air gun incidents, some uh, deemed to be accidents, some, as in the case of Andrew Morton, criminal act. Uh, criminal act. Um, so there are, uh, there are a number of injuries, but I, I, I think it's also important to say that um, e even uh, in those instances where someone sustains a minor injury, it's still extremely stressful on, on, on the victim. You can't j just simply dismiss this as, 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 a, as, a, as a trivial incident be uh, just because a person sustains a minor injury. I, I, I mean, we, we know from uh, communications we have from people how stressed people are by the fact that they have been, out of the blue, hit by something fired uh, at, a, at a distance by, by, by uh, somebody else. Just to finally convene, I thank Dr North for that response. Uh, as I said, we, what we're doing is looking at licensing in Scotland. You gave figures, or you alluded to issues in terms UK-wide, uh, we are concentrating and looking at the figures 500,000 air weapons we suspect are held in hands in Scotland. I don't know what the figure may be UK-wide, uh, but in relation to the fatalities, it's just trying to get a, a clear picture. If, and, if uh, committee, we, 
can sort of uh, uh, look back at uh, through the incidents and pick out the the, the, the Scottish uh, figures. And certainly they'll, they'll be available in the crime, uh, the, the fire crime, uh, firearm crime statistics over the last few years. Right. That would be extremely much. useful, Dr. North, if you have those those figures. It would be helpful. Uh, Willie Coffey, please. Convener, thanks, and uh, good morning to the to the panel. Good morning to you. Um, Dr North, I'm very grateful for the evidence that you submitted to the committee in writing, and uh, some of it is quite harrowing and was introduced there by my colleague uh, John Wilson. You do present some statistics in your, your paper, and you show that in terms of number of firearms offences in Scotland, that the majority of them are in fact caused by air, air weapons, and indeed there was a fatality that you referred to in the within your report. Could, could, could I ask you to tell me, as a new member of the committee, what is it you think about the licensing scheme will reduce this type of offending? What is it about the licensing that will bring that down and make the public safer? Dr North? A number of the uh, uh, more serious incidents, uh, particularly those involving young, young people, have, have been um, where they have come across a, 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 an, egg, an air gun in, 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 a, in a house and uh, uh, kept as uh, rather casually by the owner, perhaps a, a, a parent, and they have been basically pl playing around with it. And we believe that uh, if the owner had to license that, uh, that, that weapon, they would think seriously about uh, whether it should be there or not. I, I, um, it, it, what runs through, and I apologise for repeating this, what runs through so many of the incidents is just the casual nature with, with which these weapons are treated. And we think, you know, if you if you if the signal is sent out that these are dangerous and therefore need to be licensed, um, there will be a, a large number of people who think, well, we don't want them anymore. We won't just leave them lying around the house. And. Um, could it, this, this practice, is it plinking it's referred to, convener? Plinking, it was a new word for me as well, uh, I have to um, say. I mean, and as I understand it, that's where there's like a kind of casual use of this in people's back gardens. Yeah. Presumably mm -hmm. taking pot shots at objects, people or, or uh, animals too. Do, do you think the licensing scheme will, will really address that? Um, well, I, I, I understand that it... it uh, that it w won't be legal to, to, to do plinking any 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 longer. Uh, um, that, I mean, there are um, current measures that um, uh, uh, make it illegal to, to fire pellets uh, outside the confines of, of your own property anyway. Um, but ag again, uh, Gun Control Network is contacted by people who are disturbed by the behaviour of, of, of neighbours find it intimidating and, uh, and threatening and if they raise it with their neighbours um, you know find that, um, they are, that they are challenged and, and even when they've uh, complained to the police don't actually um, uh, make any progress because it's sometimes difficult to sort of prove that somebody's firing sort of slightly off offline um, <clears throat> I, I know that um, this is the only form of shooting that some air gun owners um, um, uh, undertake. But um, I think they should sort of consider what they do in, the, uh, uh, um, in a wider context and, uh, and how their neighbours feel about it. And if they are keen on shooting with an air gun, then go to an air gun club and do it. Just for clarification, um, the uh, bill, if enacted itself, won't put a halt to, to plinking necessarily, but it may reduce the amount of it that goes on um, because of the licensing regime. Well, I do you want to come back yeah, just, in? Yes, thanks very much. Just um, lastly, I mean, I, I hope to ask this of the police when they come up next, convener, but the, the determination of whether a person is, is deemed fit to own a, an air weapon and to have good reason to own one, do you have any views on what, what that should be? Because I, I would intend to ask the police how they propose to make that kind of assessment. Can we start with Miss Dunn, please? Um, yes, one specific point that I wanted to bring up was general licensing law. The committee may or may not, not know much about general licences, but the, the mechanism by which it's legal for um, people like farmers or state um, owners or employees to shoot animals that are 
deemed pests. Um, in general licensing law, if somebody has an unspent conviction for wildlife crime, they are deemed unsuitable to um, kill animals under general licensing law. And we'd really like to see this provision extended to um, air gun licences, and we think it makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Dr Norris, please. Um, sorry, can you... Uh, person. About the proper... Um, well, that, I mean, there are um, obviously guidelines um, for um, other, other firearms, and... It's clearly uh, Im important that anyone who um, uh, is licensed to shoot uh, uh, fire an air gun um, uh, does it for the, the correct reasons. Now, I know there have been some debate over, uh, over what those, those reasons should, should be, but I'm, I'm sure, that, you know, with the police help, that, that um, you know, appropriate guidelines can be um, uh, formulated um, but would, what wouldn't be allowed is the kind of casual use um, that you know, we believe is responsible for so many of the incidents um, that harm people, property and animals. Thank you. Superintendent Flynn, please. I think, again, it's back to a question for the, the police to answer at the time of the, the licensing application. If you're a young man that's staying in a high-rise flat in a, a a housing estate that you've got no access to any land, you've not got a purpose, you're not doing pest control on behalf of somebody else, then the police are going to quite rightly ask, well, why do you want one? If you've not even got a garden that you could plink in. Um, and going back to your plinking question, I firmly believe that a lot of the animals that are injured are not because of plinking, but plinking for a 17, 18-year-old shooting the same tin can gets a bit boring. And if you see something flying past, a moving target may be an attractive, attractive option. One of the things that our veterinary survey have shown is that air rifles as such very... I can't think of anything that would actually be injured by a ricochet, so that you've been aiming at your tin and it's ricocheted off that and then it's ended up embedded in a, a cat or a swan's head. This is people deliberately aiming at uh, these animals. So I think the, the licensing will get rid of the people that have got a gun that they've got absolutely nowhere no, lawful to use it in the first place. Very okay. grateful for that. Thank you. Think. And McTaggart, please. Thanks, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, and given the wealth of experience and knowledge that the panel have, convener, could I ask them for their advice on, on the bill and the regime of the licensing? Do you see any omissions? What, is there anything that should be in the bill that's not in the bill? Superintendent Flynn, please. Um, I think if, if you are going down this uh, route, you would have to include a definition of what a pest species is um, and include um, the fact that you, you must have landowners' permission um, to shoot on anything. Because lots of people will say they, they do pest control, but somebody going into uh, Holyrood Park to shoot rabbits, they've not got permission to do that. They shouldn't be doing that. There's public walking about. And again, that comes back down to the the licensing regime by the police that you've got to be able to show that you're fit and proper and you have proper place to use it. Thank you. Dr. Thank you. I'm, I'm satisfied with the bill, so I, 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 there's nothing I would change significantly. Ms. Dunn. Um, the League are um, objected animals being harmed in the name of sport, so um, we would like the provision of the shooting of um, live animals for sport to be removed. Um, from the bill. In actual fact, only a very small number of species are, can be cleanly dispatched with an air gun, and it's very difficult to um, kill an animal with um, an air gun also. So, um, yeah, that, was, that would be something that we would change. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Convener. OK. Uh, Claire um, Adamson, please. Uh, Thank a wee you. bit of memory block in <laughs> the last name, Claire, sorry. Thank you. Um, from part of the discussion this morning, um, and, and, and maybe a little bit about the confusion about what would happen to planking, whether or not it would be legal following the current bill. Do you think licensing in itself is enough, or would you like to see it combined with further regulation on usage? Or do you think it can be incorporated into this bill? Superintendent oh. Flynn, first, please. I think a lot of the planking that I know of happens in very built-up areas. Um, and, I mean, if you want to plank, planking is just target shooting. Um, it's up to the kind of gun associations to make sure there's sufficient 
uh, target practice areas. Now, I mean, there's a big difference between plinking in a back garden and having a landowner's permission in an open field where there's no backdrop, there's nothing else can be harmed, and it's actually set up for that purpose. So, again, if the police were satisfied that you were going into a 20-acre field that had no public walking through it, and if people knew that was what the purpose for, that could be taken into account. But I don't see any reason that somebody sitting in the middle of a house in a state and heavily built up when there's a kid next door and somebody up at that window should be shooting something that's potentially very, very dangerous. Dr. Norris, I, I, I agree entirely with that. Okay. Ms. Dunn, please. I agree with um, the other members of the panel. I think allowing plinking um, in an average sized back garden I mean, would kind of render the scheme pointless because so many people would apply, be able to apply for a licence and say, oh, I'm shooting in my average sized back garden. Um, they would, it, it would um, sort of just sort of render it meaningless. Thank you. Would Claire you Adamson. consider um, scouting associations or, or scouting groups or cadet groups or other groups that are doing target shooting as um, part of their activities to be plinking, or do you think that's, that's a more controlled environment? Ms Dunn, please. I think if they were doing it um, in suitable premises and weren't shooting live animals, um, perhaps in association with a shooting club, then... You know, I, I don't think we'd have any objection to that. But, um, yeah, as long as it wasn't being done um, in somebody's back garden or um, sort of casually. Dr North, yeah, yes. I, I, I assume that the scouts would, would, would be well organised and uh, uh, conduct shooting in, in, in an appropriate place and not in, not in somebody's back garden. Superintendent Flynn, please. Yeah, I mean, I would imagine someone like the Scouts Association would be using a properly uh, purpose-built place Another thing with that is that you would have supervision of the youngsters that are using them. So obviously, the, either the, the gun club or the scoutmaster would be licensed through the police and would know the responsibilities that come with it. Okay, thank, you. thank you. Cameron Buchanan, please. Um, Ms Dunn, you said in your submission that you felt that um, those under the age of 18 should not get a licence to shoot live animals. How would you sort of regulate that? Do you st are you still of that opinion? I mean, do you think that's still valid? I mean, yes, I do think that it is. I, I mean, obviously, being shot with an air gun is, you know, can be very painful to an animal. They might not be killed outright, um, and could, you know, suffer quite horribly because of that. Um, sort of, I think that you do need to have a certain level of maturity and responsibility before you would um, seek to, you know, take the life of an animal. And we think 18 is a um, suitable cut-off point for that. So a lot of people under 18 who are trying to shoot live animals, or was it just... Uh... There's a lot... Going back to the problem that there is little evidence um, with the police, um, anecdotally, there, is, there are problems with teenagers um, shooting animals in parks and um, that sort of problems. I would love to be able to provide more figures, but just the nature of the crime means that I don't. But you said the legislation should be amended. I think it's quite a difficult amendment to put in, do you not think? Um, to, or to regulate, anyway. But then, I mean, the, the pro-shooting organisations are arguing that this whole scheme is going to be very difficult to um, mm. regulate. So in that, um, you know, yes, there are some difficulties with um, the practical application. I can see that, but then that's no reason to um, back away from laws that could be very sensible. OK. Thank okay. you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, John Wilson, please. Give me a take this opportunity, since we've got Superintendent Flynn with us today, uh, and just to try and put this into context, could Superintendent Flynn give us any indication of how many animals that he's aware of have been shot using crossbows or archery bows? I have not, we've not had any reports of archery bows for a long, long time. This year we've had two incidents with crossbows, and both were in uh, Inverness. Um, the raid more roundabout area. Um, one was believed that the animal wasn't uh, hit with a crossbow, that it was dumped here. Um, before that, there was geese in Lanarkshire, but that is not a huge problem. Um, not nowhere near the, the air gun situation. Ms. Dunn, do you have any incidents using the use of crossbows or archery bows? The only one I'm aware of was, I think, two or three years ago in a park in Glasgow where a swan was targeted. 
It is within the competency of the Scottish Parliament to, to legislate on crossbows, but I mean, I think air guns are, um, as Mike said, this, um, more often used in attacks on animals than crossbows are. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you. Can I ask you if there is any additional information that you would like to give to the committee today? Um, from my point of view, um, it's not just obviously the Scottish SPCA that would support this. Uh, the survey we carried out in 2012, 91% uh, of the vet veterinary practices that responded were in favour of a change in the, the legislation. 61% um, supported licensing and only 5% supported the status quo. And now that's the members of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons. They're the people that are actually dealing with this first hand. Um, it's them that see the, the distraught that the owner goes through, the costs that the owner goes through, because a lot of people, I mean, the lady just in Paisley a couple of weeks ago, I wouldn't like to think how much it cost her to get her cat's leg amputated, how much pain that animal went through, how much cost it cost the family. And you imagine if your pet comes home and has been shot, that's an attack on you as well. Um, some people take it as a fear. Now, as I say, the 178 incidents we dealt with were reported to us. That's where a live animal has been involved and that people think there's something we can do to help. I have no idea how many people come across shot starlings and sparrows and that, that, well, it's dead, they're not going to report it to us. Um, so, no, we would uh, firmly support uh, what's being proposed. In terms of the statistics that you've just given us, um, I take it that was a, a survey that was carried out. Could you tell us by whom and how, how many folk responded to that survey? It was uh, the Scottish SPCA that wrote to the 120 veterinary practices throughout Scotland, 75% uh, of which responded, and of them, over 80% had actually, within the practice over the last couple of years, treated something that had come in with a pellet in it. A lot of the cats that are taken there, some day, their cat goes missing for a couple of days, it comes home, it's got a limp, they, they don't know it's been shot until it gets x-rayed, um, and then it, the vets have to decide whether to remove it or not. I mean, a couple of years ago, we had a Staffordshire Bull Terrier that we believe had been tied to a tree and shot because it had 14 pellets in its head, and our vet, Mr Ian Footer, removed about nine of them. It was quite a heavily built Staffordshire, so it was going to cause more damage trying to take these other five pellets out then leave them where they were, they weren't going to cause anything. But two of the, the pellets were just, luckily it had missed its eye, but we've had uh, cats with eyes taken out. We do get the occasional fatality, ranging from, uh, swans seem to be a particular target. The one in Livingston two years ago, um, it was reported by members of the public, and when we got in an x-ray, they had 14 separate pellets. And now, you're not using like a machine gun thing, it's just one pull of the trigger. That's 14 loads, 14 aims, and 14 shots. Now, that, sadly, that bird had to be put down, and I could quite easily send to the committee pictures of X-rays, the cats, the swans that we've had in. I think the horror of the stories that you have just told uh, tell us enough. I don't think we actually need to see the, the pictures. Yeah. Uh, but thank you very much for the offer. Dr North, please. Um, well, in addition uh, to the uh, <coughs> figures for fatalities and serious injuries, which I'll find for the committee, um, I don't know whether it would be helpful if um, I uh, got together a list of, uh, of some of the incidents to reflect what I've been saying about the casual nature of some, uh, of, some of these. Uh, I mean, this is just a, a pile of incidents, albeit from the hot, great, great, great Britain. Um, uh, and if, if it would be useful for the committee to see some of, some of the more recent press reports, um, I'm happy to... Um, send them. I think that would be useful. We are uh, aware of, of, of some and um, as we met for the, the first round table on licensing there had been an incident in County Durham that we'd yes. heard about at, at, yes, at that point but I think it would be uh, particularly good for some of our new committee members as well to get a flavour of, of what has gone on. We'd be very grateful for I that Dr that. North. Ms Dunn. Um, thanks Convener. Um, I mean, the only thing I've we sort of used case studies just because of the difficulty of gathering figures and as well as um, I mean, the, the sort of injuries to the cats in particular. Um, the, the, um, in the case studies, they were, you know, very horrible, as Mike's just said. And also to echo another of Mike's points, um, it clearly made the people that we spoke to feel less safe in their community when their pet had been targeted, particularly because air guns are so widely available and they, in most cases, apart from one that we've got, um, they had no idea who, who did this, apart from that it was somebody living in the same community as them. 
Thank you very much. Um, your evidence today has been uh, extremely useful. Uh, we are very grateful for your attendance. Um, can I now suspend uh, for a change of witnesses, please? Uh, thank you. I'd now like to welcome our second panel this morning. Um, Assistant Chief Constable Wayne Mawson, Head of Policing, West of Scotland. Superintendent Alec Irvin of the Licensing and Violence Reduction Division. And Chief Inspector Fraser Lamb of the Firearms and Explosives Licensing Division, all at Police Scotland. Uh, can I welcome you all, gentlemen, and can I ask if you have any opening remarks? Yes, I do, convener. On you go, uh, Mr Mawson. Thank you, Convener, and thanks for the opportunity to give evidence to you today. Uh, part one of the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill is principally about people, albeit it sets out a licensing regime reflective of the 68 Firearms Act, which deals with firearms and shotgun licensing. It is accepted that the law surrounding access to fire firearms is about public safety. This bill, as far as Police Scotland is concerned, is about making sure that inappropriate people don't get access to lethal barrelled weapons which can, by definition, kill. Andrew Morton, who was just a two-year-old toddler when he was shot in the head by a man with an air gun in 2005, is a tragic example of what can happen when the wrong people have access to lethal barrelled weapons. Such tragic incidents are thankfully very rare, but most days police and animal welfare groups have to deal with the results of air weapons being misused. Legislation which allows for responsible ownership of air weapons is to be welcomed. Air weapons in irresponsible hands are dangerous and their use for, their use for licensing of firearms, uh, excuse me, uh, keeping people safe is the priority for Police Scotland. As you were aware, the Chief Constable of the Police Service of Scotland is responsible for the licensing of firearms and shotguns and explosives in the country. Whilst understanding that there is significant uncertainty in respect of the numbers of air weapons in existence in Scotland, and consequently the demand that will be placed upon the police in respect of the proposals within the bill, 
It is a fact that we have systems in place which copes with over 53,000 certificate holders at this time. Shogun, that's the ICT system used to manage firearms in Scotland, has recently been linked up, which allows for the eight firearms licensing processing centres to effectively manage workloads throughout Scotland. I am aware it can be relatively easily adapted to manage air weapons too. In other words, we have the expertise and the experience to process applications and manage the risks. What we don't have is the budget to fund the resources to satisfy the additional demand. Costs will be incurred in upgrading Shogun, in resourcing the departments who will, who will administer the licensing regime, and in the subsequent criminal justice processes, such as ballistics examinations. This is set against an unknown demand. We welcome the provisions of the bill, which will allow for current certificate holders to possess air weapons under the terms of their existing firearm or shotgun certificates. This will reduce the demand on police resources. You may be aware that with revisions to the Firearms Act in 97, certificates were increased in term from three years to five years. This caused peaks and troughs in demand. There are three extremely busy years and two years where there is a reduction in demand. With this experience, it is essential that we legislative, legislatively build into the process a system whereby the demand is smoothed or phased, as the panel earlier said. This can be done by allowing the Chief Constable to determine the length of the first air weapon certificate issue. By doing this and by setting up a pro rata fee for the length of the first certificate, we can assess the demand and allocate resources as required. I understand that this is the first stage of the bill and revisions will likely follow after the considerations of the committee and the parliament. That said, I would like to reiterate that we commend the intention of the bill. We are of the opinion that it will reduce the ability of those intent, either by design or by recklessness, to criminally injure people, animals or damage property in Scotland. The vast majority of people who legally hold firearms in Scotland conduct their lives in a manner which reflects their acceptance of the responsibility for the safe use of their guns. Crimes involving legally held firearms in Scotland are proportionately small compared to the number of guns held. It is not those people who will be detrimentally affected by this proposed legislation. It is the people who should not have guns who will be affected and in a way which will only benefit the safety of the people in Scotland. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Assistant Chief Constable. Um, let's look at some of the budgetary implications that you have uh, talked about. Um, you have spoken about Shogun and that being easily adaptable to deal with <laughs> air rifle, air weapon licensing. Um, will Shogun be a system that matches, interlinks into I-6 when it comes into being? Yeah. Yes. It will? It will. Um, and in that regard, in terms of, uh, of dealing um, with criminality uh, from uh, air weapons, um, that interlink, I'm sure, would be helpful in terms of investigation? Absolutely. Um, all the eight legacy forces are now joined up. Uh, it's working really well. It's only been in place since October, but there have been no issues so far. It is significantly helping us uh, in firearms licensing in Scotland, and we see that an adaption to that is a relatively easy fix at a relatively small cost. Uh, we do have a provisional figure, but I would stress it's provisional, around about £20,000. Um, we heard from the previous panel um, that uh, in terms of firearms and shotgun licences, the regime that is controlled by um, Westminster rather than here, um, that the fees have not gone up for a long while, um, uh, static for a fair bit of time. Uh, and th there was the insinuation that basically the public um, are subsidising um, these licences. Uh, in terms of that public subsidy, here in Scotland, is it Police Scotland that are picking up the tab for that subsidy? 
In short, yes, it is at the moment. Um, we do a lot of work to make sure that only fit and proper people uh, receive firearms or shotguns licences. Uh, and there's a huge amount of work involved in that, including visits, follow-up visits, checking gun cabinets, etc. That is not covered, quite frankly, by the existing costs. And you're quite right, convener. I believe those costs have not changed since 2001. I don't want to ask you a particularly political question, mm. uh, Mr. Mawson, and uh, feel free to say that you don't want to, to, to answer it, but do you think that um, the costs of the licensing, licensing regime um, for firearms and shotguns should be borne by the owners rather than by Police Scotland and the taxpayer at large? Yeah, I think that's a fair question, and I, I think the answer is, quite frankly, yes. Um, if people want to own a firearm of, of any kind, whether it's a shotgun, a, a rifle or an air weapon, then they should pay the cost associated with that. We're not out to make any kind of profit from it. We just want costs recovered. Thank you. And before I move off um, the budgetary aspects, obviously the cost of dealing with air gun incidents uh, must be fairly high. Um, you know, in my own constituency, uh, a few years back, there were a spate of air gun incidents in the seating area uh, of, of my constituency. Is there any way of quantifying uh, the cost to Police Scotland of dealing uh, with crime uh, involving air weapons? Yes, we've done some in-depth uh, research into this. I'll let my colleague uh, uh, Fraser answer that one. Is that in relation to the, is that the cost of the investigation in relation to any crimes which I, I, I think obviously you can uh, only answer in terms of of the investigations we know that there are other costs in terms of the health service uh, and we know that there are huge uh, costs uh, to, to lives and to the lives of animals too but if you could give us an indication of, of what you have it would be useful chief inspector I, th I think maybe it the, the Assistant Chief Counsel was maybe talking about the processing costs here. In right. relation to actual investigation, it, these will obviously vary in relation to how much inquiry needs to be done, time taking statements, uh, in relation to the compilation of a police report, uh, the recording of that. And then, for instance, if we one of the, the core aspects of these instances is we have to prove that there's a firearms offence occurred, the basics that it is an actual gun, so therefore there's a ballistics a cost in relation to that. Each ballistics cost is, uh, I think, £180 in relation to the time you get the expertise from the ballistics experts, the provision of the report, subsequent uh, report to the Procurator Fiscal. So I think, can we specify how much it actually is per investigation? It would be very, very difficult, but however, there are significant costs within these, uh, that process. And of course, the, um, the costs for certain things, if, if somebody is killed by an air weapon, the cost uh, of, of that investigation would be immense, would it not? But the, the cost around that convener, you're not talking thousands in, in singles, you're talking tens of thousands of pounds for a, a homicide inquiry of that nature. Many uh, tens of thousands. And a, a serious injury inquiry? Again, that can be uh, several thousand pounds. So we're, we're not talking insignificant amount of money to, to investigate Absolutely um, cases not. where air weapons have been involved. Absolutely not, Conway. Um, and, you know, I, I, I know it's sometimes difficult to talk about costs, uh, monetary costs in these regards, because, you know, there is, as I said previously, that human cost and, uh, and the, the cost in terms of of animals as well. Claire Adamson, please. Um, thank you, Convener. Good, good morning. Um, my apologies, this is my first day in the committee, and I'm perhaps not up to speed as much with the bill as I would have liked to have been before the uh, evidence session this morning. Um, so, a few questions um, <laughs> in the background. Um, bearing in mind that I, I, I appreciate the, the, um, the Shogun um, uh, regulation and, and, and how you do that, that there isn't a a storage issue with air guns, it's purely licensing. Will the vetting of who is a, a fit and proper opinion, in, in, in your opinion, um, will the vetting of a uh, fit and proper person be as stringent as it is under um, the shotgun le legislation? Mr Lamb? I think 
We've, we have to reflect probably the government's intention in relation to that insofar as a lighter touch. It, it, it's all about the, the, the absolute lethality of these weapons. They aren't, I think it's, well, it is accepted that at close range they are lethal without a shadow of a doubt. However, when we license someone for a firearms license, for instance, we have something which is capable, and for sporting purposes, which will kill a deer at several hundred yards. An air weapon won't do that. Uh, again, with shotguns, extremely lethal at very, very short range, devastating. Uh, however, more devastating and more, the pro the proportionally more lethal than what an air weapon would be. And I think what we've got to do is, is accept that, that they are lethal weapons, but it's different standards of range in relation to lethality. It, it will be a lighter touch than what we do for, or it's proposed, and what our thoughts are is that it will be a lighter touch and proportionate to that lethality. So therefore, when we go down the lines of the checks, it, and we very much looked, or I've looked at the very much the checks we do for uh, the, the PVG, the protection of vulnerable groups legislation, is it, very much, it, it's not a, we don't go and visit everybody in relation to that, but however, you know, if, if we trust people to work with children and vulnerable people, should we therefore trust them to have an air weapon? And I think that's a relatively good gauge for that. If during these tests, in relation to the checking of the systems, there's information which flags up to say, there's a, there's a challenge here, then what we would then do would resort back into our tried and tested processes in, rela in relation to making sure that someone is suitable to have a firearm or a shotgun, which are quite intrusive, eh, understandably so. Um, yeah. uh, in itself, um, given that there's no additional regulation about storage, will the licence, is, is there anything that um, in gaining a licence will make behavioural change? Is there anything at all, guideline or anything at all, other than just you have a licence to have the air gun? I, Mr Lamb. I think that the people who will apply, apply for a, a licence will be responsible in their nature. I, 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 people have three options in relation to this legislation. They either hand the gun in or the air weapon in. They apply for a certificate or they risk becoming a criminal because it will then become an offence. I think the people who apply for these will be responsible in their very nature because they are willing to put themselves forward for the test of should I be suitable or otherwise. There will be guidance or we will work up guidance in relation to security, eh, in relation to how these weapons should be secured, what our recommendations would be, and that would obviously be in conjunction with, this, with the government. In, in, in terms of, um, we heard a, a kind of difference of opinion there between um, uh, Dr North and, and the convener about plinking and what, what the, the bill will do in terms of the legal situation about plinking at the moment. Um, so I'm a bit concerned that maybe there's an expectation that the bill will deliver much more than what is actually on the face of it as a licence at the moment. Um, could, could you just give me your opinion on, on that? Superintendent point? Irvin, I think you wanted to come in there. Thanks, Convener. I, I, I think in answer to your question, I think what we've got, in terms of plinking, uh, in terms of the reckless conduct of the discharge of a firearm, there are sufficient powers here. I think in terms of this bill, I think what it is, from, from my view, is it's a preventative bill and the fact that we are going to stop people who are likely to carry out that conduct get access to an air weapon. And on the other side of that, if they should commit an offence, then there's a licensing regime in place that prevents them gaining an air weapon. Again, where at this moment in time, if they commit that offence, there's nothing to stop us allowing them of going and then buying or, pur or purchasing or acquiring an air weapon. The intention of this bill will stop that happening. Um, so just a, a final opinion, if possible, convener, just to say that um, given ev everything <laughs> that we just talked about, do you believe that this will, will result in, in significant reduction on misuse of air guns in Scotland? 
I, I, I think for me, Convener, sorry, it's about accessibility. What we've got is we've got unfettered access to air weapons across Scotland. There is no control around about that. By introducing the bill, we will, ha we will have undoubtedly have those individuals in society who will want to surrender their weapons. That will reduce accessibility through that route. And, the, 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 and it's about controlling those that then access weapons. So I think yes, and that's the question, I think yes, we will prevent access. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, the I'm going to take you to the submission that Police Scotland made to the committee and uh, in answer to the first question you, in the third paragraph, you refer to uh, levels of misuse of air weapons as in recent years uh, to have fallen to a very low level. Define very low level <coughs> and what are you measuring that against? Uh, who's going to go first? I'll, I'll start, Convener. What we've identified is that recorded offences involving all firearms uh, fell in Scotland by 32% from 535 in 2011-12 to 365 in 2012-13. Of these 365, almost half, 171 offences, involved air weapons. Now, that is the lowest recorded in Scotland uh, since comparable records began in 1980. But I'd just like to bring you right up to date with some research we've, we've completed for today, which is from April this year to July this year. So the last uh, sort of six or seven months is, is what we looked at, April to July. And there were 84 offences involving air weapons specifically in Scotland. 75 of those offences were in a public place. Six of those offences involved injuries to animals. Nine offences involved injuries to humans, one of which was an attempted murder where a male was shot to the head. Nine offences were in a private dwelling or a garden etc etc so it is a real threat people are getting seriously hurt we get calls all the time to air weapon misuse and for me I, i've been um i've been a firearms commander for 14 years now in three different police forces and i can tell you that w when you're busy and there's an awful lot of fast time risk assessment to do and you've got cops on the ground and people are pointing guns. It's very difficult in certain circumstances to, to be able to distinguish between an air weapon and a real firearm or, or shotgun. It's really, really difficult and challenging. And another positive impact of the proposed legislation is that it will further reduce um, the risk of harm to people, including my own officers, I have to say, and it will significantly reduce the drain on my resources as well. Because there we are, about half of the firearms incidents in a last complete year down to air weapons. So there's an awful lot to be considered in the mix here. Um, and we really are uh, supportive of, 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 what, of what we're trying to do here. Thank you, John. Assistant Chief Constable, I welcome that updated figures because the updated figures have just given us for a four month period mm. is effectively 50% of the last accountable year yeah. figures. Yeah. Uh, based on that trajectory then you'd expect a 50% increase across the year in relation to the number of reported incidents previously. Mm. In terms of the, the issues that you're dealing with and you, you did give a list and appreciate if the committee could get a copy of that yeah. list of incidents that have been reported as uh, activities that fought, become part of the criminal activity uh, and the, the police taking action, appropriate action on that. You all, the re submission also made reference to, and you, you referred to it there, that you'd expect a reduction in the number of incidents. Uh, and I know it's very difficult for you to do this, and to speculate, of those 84 incidents that you mentioned in the last four months from between April and July, how many of those do you think would have fallen into the category as not being fit and proper to be licensed to have an air weapon? Mr. Mawson. It, it's, it's almost impossible um, 
to speculate uh, on something uh, like that. Perhaps more generically, what I can say is, with the benefit of legislation that prevents um, people who are not fit and proper or don't have a good reason for holding air weapons, a huge number will be, we expect, handed into the police for destruction. That means that there are less air guns, air pistols lying around in wardrobes, on bedside tables, in garages, in attics, um, where, frankly, anybody could pick them up, um, including young people. So it's got to be a good thing. While it's difficult to say, well, which of those wouldn't have happened had the legislation been in place, more generically we can say this is definitely the right direction of travel. In terms of the submission made, you, there's also part of the submission where you make comment on a 17-year-old student shooting rats with an air weapon in a factory for a friend uh, with the friend's permission would be con contravening the proposed legislation. And do you think that if the person, the 70-year-old, had permission to deal with a vermin problem by the owner of a property, would seriously warrant taking action against that individual? Mr. Morrison, or Mr. Lyle. I th I, that, that example is used in relation to proposed legislation where the conditions which are set out for someone under 18 it identifies an employment for pest control. So therefore someone who is legally shooting on an area where they're allowed to shoot, if they weren't employed, they wouldn't be allowed to be engaged in pest control. So that was the example that that was brought out from in relation to legislation and was... So you think the legislation might be in contradiction to the current demands by the Scottish Government to lower the voting age? <laughs> I'm just using the lowering the voting age to 16, 17 as being a re responsible adult at 18 for the purposes of this legislation. Uh, Yet at the same time, we are saying that... Uh, individuals over the age of 16 should be entitled to the vote. Do you think the age bar is set too high in terms of the legislation? I, th I think the 18-year-old uh, was set out to reflect other legislation, the Firearms Act 1968, and I think other European legislation, and I think it's, it's set roughly at that bar. Uh, I, I, I must admit, I had absolutely no... That thought didn't cross my mind in relation to a uh, 16-year-old at that particular time. Uh, I, I was just highlighting the fact that the, perhaps the legislation is slightly restrictive in relation to the, oppor the opportunity to be involved in a, a lawful purpose. But, however, by saying it's got to be linked into employment, I thought it made it... Personally, I thought it made it too restrictive. Right, thank you very much. And finally, in relation to the the submission made. You, the Police Scotland submission raises questions in relation to the uh, section 26 of the bill uh, about the notification to the Chief Officer of Police and the time limit that's set for that notification. Uh, could you give your explanation as to why you think that may be a particular problem uh, in relation to the legislation? Mr Lamb. I, I think that was basically what's the purpose of it. Uh, if a, if an, an air weapon is sold to, for instance, a, a French national, it has, no, uh, it has no serial number on it or whatever, then what are we realistically expected to do with that piece of information to suggest that someone who stayed in France was sold a, an air weapon which is, to all, in, to all intents, unidentifiable? Uh, what would we record and what purpose would we record it for? Uh, we couldn't see the, uh, quite frankly, couldn't see the point of it. Uh, what would we do with that information? And finally, convener, just a question. Please, so, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry, convener. Just a, 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 I thought I'd better get this one in. How quickly do you think the police will be able to introduce this licensing regime following royal assent? We have plenty of time between now and the likely introduction date to get our ICT in place our guidance out to staff, our training systems in place. So we, we will be uh, ready for any likely introduction in 2016.
OK, thank you. Willie Coffey next, please. Thanks very much, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, in terms of the fit and proper test and the good reason to have an air weapon, as I was asking the previous panel, what is the guidance for you to enable you to assess that? And is it Scotland-wide assessment? So that if a person receives a licence in one part of Scotland and then moves to another part of Scotland, do they have to reapply, or is it a Scottish-wide licence? Uh, Chief Inspector Lamb. Sorry. With the, the introduction of Police Scotland, we had the, the ability to standardise and move towards a standardisation of process so that, for instance, if you, if you apply for a certificate in, in WIC or in Dumfries, then the test is the same. The test in relation to revocation and refusal and so on is all it, it, it's, it's consistent and we're moving towards greater consistency with the aim of absolute consistency in relation to firearms licensing. Uh, in relation to the fit and proper test... The, 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 the test is a, it is, it's really round about responsibility. It's about, does this person, is this person a, a, a responsible person? And in relation to the reason for accessing the firearm, a, which is what it is, it's under, under, under the, the air weapon legislation, the, the, the reason to have that would be extremely important. A, and it would be consistent in relation to guidance, which we would run up and would say, this is what we do, this is what we accept as, as good reason to have a firearm. And that's already reflected. We're, we're used to dealing with good reason tests in relation to shotguns and firearms at the moment. So therefore, we would be able to very quickly ad adapt our thinking and, ad and, 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 and adapt our, the tests that we would require for the actual bill. Is the assessment mainly subjective, though, or is it based on any evidence about the person's history, record and so on and so forth. I'm thinking, convener, that if a person's refused a licence, say, in Ayrshire, but then moves up to Aberdeen and tries again, will there be a record of that attempt to, to have the licence? Does your IT system cope with that so you would know? But in, in terms of the test itself, is it fairly is there a subjective element to it that like a person could try and be lucky to be assessed, say, in Aberdeen compared to Ayrshire? It, you know? if, if, if a person was to move... It, the actual nominal details would be rec would be recorded on Shogun. The person's details would be recorded on Shogun, which is accessible if you're working in Dumfries or in Aberdeen. It's the same. So, therefore, someone in Aberdeen can bring up a record of someone who previously stayed in Dumfries. They would see what the decision-making process was in relation to that. Uh, the, the guidance would set out. We would have to run up get our, or bring together guidance which would say this is what a reason to believe, uh, sorry, a reason to have that firearm if it's, or what the good reason is. So we would have a, a set criteria for good reason. We have that already for shotguns and, 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 and firearms, especially in relation to firearms, which is slightly different legislation under the 1968 Act. Mm -hmm. It's got to be really, really specific. What are you going to use this gun for? Mm -hmm. And it's specific guns. So if you've got a calibre, a 0.17 HMR, eh, which is used for small vermin, well, you're going to be using that for small vermin. If you've got a much bigger calibre, a, a 270 or a, a 0.270, you're going to be using that for deer. You can't use them. Uh, they're, they're just different tools. And that's what I see air weapons are. They are different tools used for different jobs. They are used for, for instance, pest control, uh, shooting, shooting pigeons in a buyer, which are defecating over feed, cattle feed and so on. The farmer wants to get rid of them. If you use a much, much more powerful weapon, it starts to drill holes in the roof and it's inappropriate. So therefore, it's a tool for the job. And what would your good reason be for that? And if they said it's for vermin control, shooting rats in an enclosed place, shooting pigeons or whatever, then that would be accepted as a good reason. And um, forgive my ignorance, convener, but is there an appeal process associated with this so that a person who's rejected can appeal? And who do they appeal to if it's a Scottish-wide assessment process? It, there is an appeal process within the bill, uh, which I think would go to Sheriff Court. Again, that's replicated within the 1968 Act uh, right. for someone who has refused or revoked in relation to a firearm or shotgun certificate. Mm -hmm. And my last question, convener. Um, we, we heard previously, I think, from, from Jennifer Dunn and Dr North that there's probably likely to be much, many more incidents than actually are ever are reported because of the nature of some of these, these offences. Um, are you therefore permitted to, when an incident does occur, to consult the register and pay a visit to those who are uh, licence holders for air gun weapons? And can you also 
uh, use the information that you have about unsuccessful applications for air gun weapons to visit those persons in relation to any incidents that might occur? I think that if we were, in fact, I know that if we were in receipt of information which suggests that someone's using a gun inappropriately, eh, we're all over it immediately. Because what, the prime reason of the legislation and our prime reason is to keep people safe. And if I've got information to suggest that someone's inappropriately using a gun, well, eh, we want to find out all about it and find out what circumstances are and remove that gun. Uh, probably at the earliest opportunity and put our foot in the ball and actually think about what we're going to do with this. Uh, that will be recorded on Shogun. Uh, it will be it's, it's already recorded on the system. So the information never goes away. And would we use, be able to use information from a previous application? Absolutely, because that information is there. It's, it's evidence in relation to what the inquiry officer found out, what the witnesses were speaking to, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, we're, we're, as I say, we're, we're dealing with this on a daily basis with the 53,000 people who own, uh, who are certificated to have firearms in Scotland. So, a lot of what the legislation, the bill proposes is reflected in, by the 1968 Act, and we would, we would try and not reinvent the wheel in relation to that. We'd be using very much the same processes. Just to clarify that fairly, just, just so those who might be unsuccessful in applying for a licence will still be known to you should incidents occur. They can possibly be amongst the, those yes. people that you might wish to visit in relation to an incident. Yes. Thank you. That's very Th helpful. Thank you. Before, before I take in Cameron Buchanan, um, in, in relation to um, Mr Coffey's question round about the Dumfries Aberdeen situation, um, was Shogun in place before... Um, Police Scotland, and how did coordination, or was there coordination uh, in the eight forces round about applications before the inception of Police Scotland? Before the, the, the inception of Police Scotland, you had eight chief constables who were each responsible for firearms licensing within the area in which the certificate sure. resides. With one uh, chief officer of police now for the whole of Scotland, uh, we've got to have consistency. There, but so, so it would have been easier in yesteryear to move from Aberdeen to Dumfries, having been refused a uh, firearms uh, licence in Aberdeen to get one in Dumfries? Uh, there were certain markers were put on the, the police national computer in relation to a refusal or a revocation. So, therefore, so licensed and staff in Aberdeen would be able to identify that very quickly and say there's a marker on the PNC that this person's been refused or revoked in the legacy Strathclyde, and then we'd be picking up the phone and but speaking to our colleagues. not as consistent as what, as what you've got in place now? You're it's much, much more consistent now. Superintendent Irvin, yes. you were... Thanks, Convener. I was just going to say that there was, there was really no uh, formal mechanism for notification when certificate holders moved from uh, or, or were refused cer certificates in one chief constable's area uh, uh, and then applying for another. Uh, well, it was like, it's, of course, it's linked to residents in terms of the 68 Act, so they would, well, fundamentally, practically, they would have to get in a different address under the Chief Constable that was making the decision. In practical terms, there was no way of us mapping across Scotland who was applying to different Chief Constables um, uh, across the country. However, the new system and new processes in place that allow us to manage it as a nation. Mr Mawson, were you yes, I was just going to add to that, convener, that it, it is now much more joined up. I mean, the point that you made there, uh, Mr Kofi, around subjectivity is a point well made, I think. Um, what I can say is, as lead for firearms licensing for Scotland, I've now started a process of inviting all firearms licensing staff, whether they're police officers or members of support staff, into training events at Tully Allen for whole days at a time. They get the same training to the same standard, along with the same guidance. Uh, we share experiences, we, we share um, difficulties and the challenges, um, and, and that is all going a long way to reducing the element of subjectivity significantly. And of course, everything is now recorded on the national database that everyone has got access to. Thank you. Uh, Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you very much. As I understand it, not every air gun or air pistol has an identification, unique identification number. How are you going to get around that when you're trying to license them? Mr Lamb. The, the bill proposes it's about people rather than, rather than guns. So therefore, uh, if you will be allowed to have a certificate to possess air weapons, it, it, within, for instance, the shotgun uh, legislation, uh, you're allowed to hold as many shotguns as you wish under your shotgun certificate. 
it's different for the firearm certificate. But they're identified, though, aren't they, on the but shotgun they, certificate? They are, they are identified. Uh, there, wouldn't be a, there wouldn't be a mechanism, as far as the bill, as far as our, our understanding of the bill is, is that uh, to actually identify, for instance, it's a point two two air rifle. Uh, as you say, a lot of them don't have identification mm. numbers on them, so how would we be able to identify them? It would be a case of that you, as an individual, are allowed to possess your weapons. Would the quantity then be specified, like it is in the, in the shotgun certificate? You, I've got two shotguns, and it's specified what make they are, what number they are. There's Air guns, would you say you can have two, three, or four? Would that, is that proposed, or is uh, that the idea? There's no proposal for that, as far as right. I'm aware in the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Anne McTaggart, please. Thanks, and like I had asked the earlier panel, um, so you have had loads of time for to sit and make up a wish list. Um, that is the season to be jolly. Can you inform us, is there anything in the bill that would make it a better bill? Is there anything that's omitted from the bill just now, as it stands? I'll let Alec and, and Fraser add some uh, more value to this. But for me, the big strategic issue is, is the issue of smoothing. What we can't have is, um, you know, thousands of applications coming in on one day, mm. uh, really struggling to cope with that, and then five years later, exactly the same happening again. That just doesn't make uh, for a pragmatic, common-sense process. We need some kind of phasing or a smoothing-in approach. OK. Uh, Superintendent Irvin. Thanks, Convener. I, I think that's a critical issue for us as an organisation. In terms of the contents of the bill and how it will be actually managed, the creation of offences and the licensing regime, uh, I think I'm pretty confident that it actually covers all the things that supports us as an organisation, keeps our community safe and allows a proportionate licensing regime to come in place. And Chief Inspector Lamb, please. Uh, to re uh, reiterate Mr Morrison's point, it, it's hugely important we get smoothing uh, right because we're going to have five years Come the legislation, there will be a huge number of, well, sorry, an unknown number, but probably quite a significant number of people will apply for the rear weapon certifi uh, certificate. If, by the reading of the legislation we get now, there will be a, a, an ongoing small demand, and then in five years' time we have a huge bulk of, again, uh, uh, renewals. So every five years we're going to be faced with a, a huge workload for a very short time, and then uh, for the next four or four years, 11 months, it, it diminishes. That's very difficult to plan for staff, uh, resources, commitment, checks, etc., etc. Uh, the proposal to, to smooth is that for the first certificate only, uh, for the first certificate only, that the chief constable can decide how long the certificate is, which will then let us be able to have the same number of applications per month when it comes to renewal. Uh, so certificate number one would last for a year, certificate number two, 13 months, etc., until you get to certificate number 60, which is five years and 11 months. And then what we've got is the same number of people every month applying for a certificate, and we can plan for that and resource for that. Anne? There has been um, previous weapon amnesties. How, how did you manage with that? And what lessons were learnt from that? Mr Lamb? Uh, there's recently been an amnesty down in, uh, uh, down in Eng England and Wales in relation to other firearms. And uh, the Met, for instance, or the Metropolitan Police, recovered, there was 350 firearms handed in, of which I think it worked out around about a quarter uh, of them were air weapons. Uh, we are probably looking at a much... The, I think there'll be our, our figures will outstrip that in relation to air weapons. A scrap metal, you're telling us, basically. Um, I think there'll be a lot of uh, handling of uh, air weapons getting handed in and getting destroyed. Uh, I think the numbers will draw will dwarf the amnesty figures in England and Wales uh, in relation to the volumes. As people. Their grandfather had an air weapon that's lying up in the loft. We've not used it for decades upon decades, and we've got no good reason for it. So, therefore, we're going to go and take it down and hand it into police. Anne? No, that's fine. Thank okay, you. Thank Thanks. you. Claire Adamson, please. Um, thank you. Um, it, was, it was just in, in a supplementary to Ca Cameron Buchanan's questions. Um, obviously, you know, if people have criminal intent, it's a difficulty for us all in society and we can't get over the fact that some people will. But can I run a scenario by you that um, if you do find someone 
who's not in possession of a licence but in possession of a gun under what's just been said, can they not just claim that a licence owner owns that gun if there's no record of how many guns each person has in terms of their gun licence? So, yeah, I'm assuming that maybe there's someone slipped through and has an air gun licence who's not upstanding. You know, what would happen in that situation? I so think... Uh, I think, I think there's a healthy dose of cynicism within police officers, and I think that uh, we would be going and asking the other person if they've got a certificate and all the sorts of investigative questions which we would really expect uh, officers to ask of these individuals. Uh, I, I just think we'd be able to deal with that in relation to uh, being able to appropriately investigate it and then ascertain if that's the fact or not. And within the power of the bill, if you suspected that somebody was basically at it in that scenario, mm -hmm. that it wasn't their gun and it, it did belong to the other person and they were in collusion with them, do you have the power to remove their licence yes. at that point? Yes, because I mean, it's, it's the unfitted to be entrusted test. Uh, and unfitted to be entrusted is actually quite a, it's quite a low bar. And it's been accepted to be quite a low bar in relation to firearms legislation. So uh, the, I think if someone was telling us lies and we were proven, they were proven to be telling us lies, I think that's unfitted to be entrusted okay. with a firearm. Okay, thank you. It has been said by some that this legislation will only affect law-abiding citizens um, and will not do anything to stop or decrease criminality. What would you have to say about that, gentlemen? I think, convener, I've, I've kind of covered that already, in that we know that there are uh, a lot of air weapons out there. The exact number is, isn't known. Um, the gun trade, say, half a million. I think this legislation, people will either register, and they'll be the people, for the most part, that are fit and proper. We know that. I think a huge number will be sent to the police for uh, scrap and to be disposed of. And then there's that third uh, group of guns um, that will still lie around. But it'll be a significantly smaller number than the thousands that are currently in circulation. That somebody, just for circumstance, something spontaneous, could pick up on a day uh, and do something very, very silly with. We've spoken about the, the 84 offences in, in the last four or five months, including an attempted murder, a shot to the head, um, this will definitely have uh, a positive uh, impact on keeping people safe. Thank you very much for your evidence today, gentlemen. Uh, it's uh, uh, appreciated. Um, I now suspend the meeting and we move into private session.